Chapter 16, Aunt Constance. Ida's whole life was being ripped away. Dad, Mum, Bonnie, and now this. The man with the clipboard looked over his glasses. Ah, Miss Barnes, isn't it? What she you want? What are you doing in my house? I'm afraid, Miss, it isn't your house. He dangled the landlord's set of keys. Your rent was only paid up to last a week last Tuesday and without any funds to cover the arrears and forthcoming payments, I'm afraid we have to repossess said house and allocate it to a family who can. Besides, it's much too big for one young girl. Ida flumped onto her kitchen chair. At least they had left that. But there's my sister. Where will we go? He ran the end of his pencil down the sheet that was clipped to the board. Well, I see your sister's already been taken into the care of the town council. I think you're due for the training school. By my reckoning, they'll be coming to collect you in the next day or two, when the landlord will be taking complete repossession. Thuds through the ceiling and quite a bit of bad language came from upstairs. Mum's chest of drawers, her pride and joy, was wedged at the top. What are you doing? You can't take that. It's not a weekly payment. My mum bought it with my dad's army pension. Well, she might have, said the clipboard man, but it will cover it will cover some of what's owed. Now, move yourself out of the way. Chop, chop. Ida remembered Mr Rogers' carburettor and his tools. Where were they? Out of the corner of her eye, she saw its dull metal under the draining board where the curtain didn't go fully across. Gav, we need a hand with this chest shouted an upstairs voice. Very well, the clipboard man put his clipboard on the kitchen table and went to help the men on the stairs. Ida glanced at the board. The paper was a list of everything they owned. Everything in the little house except for the most important things. Ida, Bonnie and Mum. Ida's whole life was falling apart. But they mustn't take the carburetta or the tools. They belong to Mr Rogers. So she, so she stood in front of the curtain and pretended to wash her hands under the tap. With a few lumps of plaster and a lot of huffing and puffing, Mum's chest of drawers finally came down the stairs. Righty-o, I think that's us done for the day, said the clipboard man, putting the board in his briefcase and snapping it shut. We'll be back for the rest on Monday. Got another job on tomorrow. She followed him to the front door. In the sitting room, there were shiny patches of floor where the sofa and Dad's armchair had been. The mantelpiece clock had gone, and even the brass coal bucket from the grate. If it weren't for Bonnie, she would have given up there and then. As the bailiffs left in their lorry, Ida quickly checked up and down the road to see if anyone else in Camellia Lane had seen them. The road was empty except that those girls, the thieves, were skulking round the corner in Trinity Street. Had they come to gloat? She had a feeling there were more of them than just the two she'd already bumped into, which only made it worse. Ida went back inside, closed the door, pulled Miss Lovelock's mum's shawl close around her shoulders and gave in to all her tears as she sobbed her way upstairs. All Mum's things were heaped on the bed. Ida sat down and held a nightie from the pile up to her face. She felt the softness against her skin and breathed in the smell. If she closed her eyes and imagined hard, she could pretend that Mum was in the room, telling her that she was her wonder girl, telling her how proud she was of her, how much she loved her. Oh, Mum... Official-looking pieces of paper, like Mum and Dad's marriage certificate, Thomas Albert Barnes to Mary Elizabeth Coles, 25th of May, 1919, and a little bundle of letters tied up with a pink ribbon were all mixed up higgledy-piggledy with Mum's clothes. She found a brown envelope with her and Bonnie's names on the front. It wasn't stuck down, so she looked inside. It was only their birth certificates. There were also a few old photos of a man and lady in stiff, very old-fashioned clothes. The empty money jar and a little black velvet box. She opened the box and inside were Mum's rings. Her gold wedding ring and her engagement ring with a sparkly blue stone. 
Ida should keep them safe. But there weren't many places left to hide anything. Then she had a brainwave. She unscrewed one of the brass bed knobs by the head of the bed and pushed the box inside before screwing it back up again. She would definitely remember to get those out again before Monday. Ida had a last long sniff of mum's nighty and pretended she wasn't in this after mum upside down world. She tidied up as best she could, picked up the pile of soft warm blouses, private pieces of underclothing and a silky green petticoat. She felt a lump under the petticoat and remembered that she put the purse in mum's chest of drawers. She snapped it open and yes, it still had that strange note about Uncle Arthur from Baby inside. Her first thought was the cheek of it. And thinking of them just now, seeing her, seeing her shame, made her want to screw it up, run downstairs and throw it on the fire. But the fire was out. And there was something about Uncle Arthur this morning that didn't feel right. Now that she no longer had Bonnie or Mum, he seemed less eager to help. She told herself it was because Bonnie was his special girl and she was Mum's wonder girl. But the thought niggled. She snapped the purse shut with the note still inside. She was really hungry, even after Miss Lovelock's soup. There was one crust, which she ate straight from the bread bin. There was no doubt she was going to have to do something about a job and food and paying the rent arrears, but not before she got Bonnie. And there was no time like the present. While it was still light, papers or no papers, she was going now. Ida buttoned up her map, Mac, wrapped Miss Lovelock's mum's shawl round her neck and turned to walk purposely out of the back door. But it occurred to her that tools might come in handy, a screwdriver at least. She was sure they weren't going to give up, weren't going to give up Bonnie just like that. So, so she swept back the curtain under the sink and from Mr Rogers' toolbox, she took a screwdriver, a spanner, a hammer and a little hacksaw and put them in Mum's shopping bag. She decided on the long route to Netterfield Grange, down Trinity Street and turn right up the West Street, so she could think and gather up her courage. She said hello to Mr Winters, carrying a crate of oranges inside his shop, and waited for a tram to trundle past before she crossed over. With each step Ida took towards Netterfield Grange, her heart grew heavier, colder and sadder. If they didn't give her Bonnie back, she would just break in with her tools and get her. Was there a commandment about not breaking in? There was one about not stealing and she wasn't intending to steal anything that didn't belong to her in the first place. Retrieving wasn't stealing. When she passed the tram shed, shielded from the grange by a thick high hedge, she knew she'd left the cosy Netterfield behind. Behind its railings, Netterfield Grange Orphanage loomed like a Frankenstein's monster, tall and scary with deep shadowy windows for eyes. Early lights at the other end of the street twinkled, while up here the dark hovered lower and fell faster. In the shadow of the gloomy building, Ida felt small and excluded. But it was strange how clinging to the railings from outside already made her feel like a prisoner. For a building full of children, it was very quiet. In the lull between trains, there might be an occasional cough and splutter of a motor car, a distant dog barking or crows cawing but never any sound at all that might have been mistaken for happiness. Even the scraggy shrubs, like lonely hedgehogs dotting the orphanage grounds, look starved of love and attention. Ida rattled the iron gates, as tall and spiky as the railings. A thick chain wound through the bars and held them shut. A heavy padlock made sure they stayed that way. She took the little hacksaw out of Mum's shopping bag and found what looked like the weakest link of the chain. The orphanage grounds were deserted and when she checked over each shoulder no one was passing behind her either. 
the minute she started sawing, the hacksaw blade bent and barely made a scratch on the link. She put the hacksaw back and tried the screwdriver on the padlock screws, but the screws were stuck fast. She had another idea. Perhaps if she could grip one of the bars in the fence with the spanner, it would loosen and she could pull it out. But all the spanner did was take the paint off the bar and some skin off Ida's palm. She dropped the spanner with a clang back into Mum's shopping bag. If Ida was going to get inside, she was going to have to climb over. Or maybe 